All right, guys. So today we are going to be, or this podcast, not today. You might be watching it tonight. Who knows when you're watching? Who knows when you're learning? Wow. Crazy. All right. Anyways, came back. Um, we're on now page four. This is still the, um, up here. Oh, sorry. It keeps on popping in, but you can see it right above my cursor, right up there. It says page four. Um, we're at historysage.com. We're using these, uh, lecture notes and this podcast is about humanism, as I said earlier. All right. So what is humanism? Well, first of all, guys, at the same time that the Renaissance begins opening kind of like this box of questions and these box of ideas that people start actually running with. At the same time, this brings up a movement towards what's called humanism. Well, it should be pretty easy what humanism is. It's thinking like a human. But remember, that's hard for us to think like that because we live in the year 2015 or whatever year you're listening to this because I might record it for later. So presently, as a human, what do you guys feel as humans we should do? Well, I bet you here is thinking, well, we should have a better life. And I know this sounds like I'm repeating from the Renaissance, but because it's kind of quite true. And this is why humanism and the Renaissance go together so nicely. So they began to ask questions. How do I make my life better? How can I be a better human? They began saying things like, hey, maybe we shouldn't spit on the ground. Maybe we should have these things called manners. Um, how should we treat each other as social groups? I mean, all of these questions that we still probably gather today and still talk about and think about today, they began asking back then. And I'm sure many people asked during the dark ages, but really people feel safe enough actually began asking these type of questions. So let's go into humanism and what it is. First of all, it's a revival of antiquity. Mr. Naimatsu, earlier you talked about classics. I thought classics mean Greece and Rome. Is antiquity the same? Yep. Welcome to the world of AP European history synonyms, where you have to remember 15 words for the same idea. So whenever you hear the word Greco-Roman, Greece or Rome, antiquity or classics, it's talking about the same thing. It's talking about the ancient cultures of Greece or Rome. So what they did is they began, as you guys know from my previous podcast about the Renaissance, they began gathering arts, literature, things from Greece and Rome and began looking at them. And after they began looking at them, they began thinking, man, is there a way, as your section thesis says, can we marry the old Greek Roman ideas with our new way of living here in the year 1400, 1500. Can we do that? And humanists said, hell yeah, we can do that. We can put these things together, man. We can take that old stuff and learn from old people that did great things and make it our own. And I think that's a really good idea. I think that's what actually very successful people do. They copy people around them and make it kind of their own. And we kind of talked about that last year in geography. So anyways, um, what is humanism? It's a strong belief in individualism and the great potential of human beings. And when I say individualism, believing that you have the power to be you. You're like, Mr. Amatsu, that's not that big of a deal. I've heard that a million times. I'm allowed to be what I want to be. I can dress what I want to be. But you guys have to understand, in those days, you were thought of as your social class. In other words, if you're a serf, you're a serf. If you're a slave, you're a slave. If you're an artist, you're an artist. We didn't know as Michelangelo, the great artist, or Leonardo da Vinci, the great thinker, or Brandon Amimatsu, the influential teacher that wants to better his life both at school and also at home. Those things really didn't care about. You were a serf, we knew what you did. You were a slave, you did what you did, you move on. So these guys with individualism say, you know what? I don't know about being labeled like that. My name is Brandon. My name is Johnny. My name is Mr. Procopio. My name is blah, 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 whoever it is. And I believe I'm a little bit uniquely different than the person next to me. And that's awesome. And that's okay. And you shouldn't treat us all the same. So again, look at this. Humans were seen as together as small, wicked. They're not important, inconsequential, and, show, and should focus solely on earning salvation. I talked about that in my earlier podcast regarding the um, Middle Ages, man. Most people didn't really care about this life on earth. And I know most of you guys are like, well, that's crazy. That's all we care about is this life on earth. I know because we're not becoming as religious. We're a little bit more spiritual, guys. But these guys were super superstitious and super religious. And so all they cared about was going to where? Yeah, you guessed it. Arrow up in the sky means heaven. So that's all they cared about was what are the things I have to do or don't do in this small little 30-year life so that I can go to heaven. So the, um, some people go, you know what? Maybe we should focus on this life here on earth. Maybe we shouldn't just focus on the afterlife in heaven. And so they begin to focus on things. What's one thing? Okay, virtue. The idea of being a man and the idea as a man that you should have dreams and you should be able to pursue those dreams. Whoa, sounds like Martin Luther King. I know, crazy, 1500s. 
So they're coming up with this idea. They believe that a key to a good life was reason and nature, that you should use your brain, that you should be educated, that you should be thoughtful, and that you should come with these thoughts, think about these thoughts, and make your own ideas, and you have those based off of your observations in nature. Sounds very scientific. I know. That was new to them. And remember, this is being preached or being told, not just to the upper classes at this time. The humanists are trying to get everybody to act like this. And that's scary. We'll talk about that later. So they focus on first studying ancient languages. And we're going to talk about that later. Obviously, Latin. And why Latin? Because it's Rome. Yep, there we go. Back to the antiquity, Greece and Rome. You're starting to see a theme that Greece and Rome are super important regarding humanism and the Renaissance. So they focus on Latin, and then after, remember I told you guys how the Byzantine Empire fall? Remember I told you about Constantinople? Remember I showed you the map, and we had all of the Greeks moving into Italy? Yeah, well, because that fell, Greek became studied, because the Greeks brought that over. By um, 1500, virtually all of the significant ancient Roman and Greek texts had been rediscovered, were translated, printed. Now, here's a word that you might want to write, and I'm going to write it right here. It was vernacular. You know, this is a big word. And vernacular basically means the um, native language. And I'll give you an example. I'll put English, Italian. Let's see. We can talk about France a lot, so we'll French, um, etc. Um, these are any languages other than Latin and Roman, which are kind of root languages to some of these, um, some of these languages. Um, so it is the one that you're speaking, like Spanish. It's the one that the commoner would speak. Um, if you ever read Latin, um, Latin's in science a lot, man, it is a hard language to read read or even to actually speak correctly so they began actually translating a lot of these ideas these greek texts actually into this why so the common man like you and me can read it we don't have to be some super educated doctor or artist to understand what the heck this book is about um interesting that they rejected a greek man aristotle um and they actually believed in some of the ideas of cicero this really isn't that important and we'll kind of move on a little bit more um, the big thing about humanism is it's really found in the idea of education and a liberal arts education. And a liberal arts education is the type of education you guys gain today. A class that has spelling and grammar called English, has rhetoric, how to create sentences and speak called speaking or English, um, poetry, again, English, history, my class, politics, government, um, moral philosophy, how to become a better human being. Well, how do you know what's right? Morals. How do you know what's wrong? Morals. And what's our belief about them? A belief of what was right and wrong. Um, a big push is civic humanism. You know, and it's the idea that not only should, we, as humanists, should we push this idea to all people, but really we should actually prepare, we should educate and prepare our leaders. Remember that these people were not, so most people were not voted in, or if they had some kind of voting in system, it was only done by the upper classes. It's kind of like more of a rigged game. It wasn't a true democracy. So if we're going to have these leaders showing us what to do right and wrong, shouldn't they be educated? Shouldn't they be humanist? Shouldn't they be well learned so that they can make informed decisions and be great role models for the rest of us? Would That's what a humanist would argue would be the role of government. Um... Often humanism was more secular than lay dominated. Um, lay dominated means this. Um, a lay person is somebody that does not believe in organized religion, but is still very religious. Whereas a secular person believes that religion shouldn't be so strong in my everyday actions. A lay person would probably believe that God is always involved in a lot of our decisions, but I don't need a priest or church to tell me what God's saying secular again would be you know what god is here he's important but he's not like controlling me like a puppet on everything i do every single day even though we like to blame a lot it seems like all right moving on so anyways um hopefully that gives you an idea of up here of humanism by now you should have a good understanding of what humanism is now moving on the most famous humanist i mentioned this in my last podcast i mean he's the one that came up here with the dark ages on the renaissance I, on that last podcast with the dark um i talked about a humanist and it kind of Took me a couple seconds to figure out who it was. I looked to my left, looked to my right, and I remembered it was Petrarch. There he is, Petrarch. And why is he important? He's going to the father of humanism. Guys, whenever we see the word father of, you need to know it. Um, you guys already know about this guy, John Jacques Rousseau, who is the father of romanticism and created the and created the idea of a social contract, which we did. So, you know, father of humanism, got to know him. He's important. He's concerned the first modern writer. Um, 
he didn't really focus on religion. Uh, most people who were educated at that time were educated by the church. And so when you started writing, what did you write? You wrote about God. You wrote about Jesus. You wrote about Mary. You wrote about all those things that had to do with religion. He says, you know what? Heck with that. I'm just going to talk about the normal person. I'm going to write books and poetry about the normal person rather than always focusing on God and Christ and all these people are supposed to be reminding us about either heaven or hell. He claimed that the Middle Ages, the time between the fall of the Roman Empire, not the Holy Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire, the one with Rome, the one that killed Jesus, the, the one with all the, the great leaders, um, it ends in about, I think, about I want to say five, 600 AD and the emergence of the Renaissance, which again is 1450. He calls it the dark ages. All right. And, um, the reason why he does that is he feels that during this time, there was a lot of learning. You know, you go to Rome and Rome had incredibly beautiful plumbing systems. They had democracy. They, they had rioting. They had some kind of education level. Women were involved in politics and then bang, the whole Roman Empire, I mean, sorry, the Roman Empire goes down and then we have the Dark Ages where we have knights, kings, and queens. And basically everybody goes back to a, to a more backwards kind of time of life. So he called the Dark Ages. He was perhaps the uh, first to use critical textual analysis in ancient texts. Um, what does that mean? He actually began looking at old texts and saying if they're right or wrong, where people just kind of study them to understand how they were thinking. You know, no, 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 I'm actually going to... I'm actually going to criticize this. I'm actually going to talk about what's right and wrong inside of this text, which is very interesting. And he, um, he wrote some famous poetry. He's also known, it doesn't say here, but he's also, I believe, oh, no, that's a different one, uh, I think. So anyway, sorry, sorry to lose you here. So Petrarch's probably, probably one of the most famous. Um, we also have Boccaccio. Um, Boccaccio um, created an encyclopedia, as you can see here. Um, and then he comes up with some earthly tales that uh, talks about social commentary. Again, social commentary, not religious commentary. Social commentary, how to treat a woman, how to treat a child, how to treat a man, how to treat a family member, how to be a good person. Okay, so again, here's that human character and behavior. Oh, interesting. Talk about sexual and economic behavior. Hmm, maybe teenagers should read this. Don't know. All right, moving on. Um, we have Bruni, we have Lorenzo Valla. You guys can read that. Um, these guys I haven't seen pop up too much. Um, Ficione, Miradola. Again, look at these names too, you know, largely Italian um, with the Medici. So notice the Medici being popped up. Again, Italy is such a strong place for the uh, humanism and Renaissance. Um, this man does pop up. I see him a lot. Um, Procopio and I seen him. So Castellani, the book of the courtier. Um, again, here's that word most important. If it's uh, something like that, that means we need to know it. So Castellania probably created one of the most important book, uh, or on education is called the book of the courtier. And really what it was, was a book of manners. Like, Hey, um, we need to use the bathroom. Let's not go behind the curtain. Remember at this time there was no plumbing. And so actually when I've been to France, um, they talked about the fact that when people had to use the bathroom, they'd actually just go behind a curtain and then you have maids just clean up the mess. I mean, that is wacky. I know, but I mean, look at this. I mean, uh, Hey, by the way, we shouldn't spill on the floor, especially when you're at the dinner table. Um, maybe we should use some of the utensils instead of using your hands. Um, maybe we should wipe your nose with your sleeve instead of just like hucking it on a loogie on the desk. I mean, that's in, honestly what the book was about. It was talked about manners. So hopefully you're beginning to understand how the Middle Ages truly was. That it was this largely uneducated mass doing whatever the heck they thought was okay. And as long as they didn't violate the priest, the church, or God, or the landlord, they'd be okay. So these guys are asking for a little bit more of this life. Um, he talks about the Renaissance man and the ideal Renaissance man who knows tend to be, obviously, knows Greek and Roman classics. There's that word class again. And basically could do a lot of different things. Um, and probably the most impressive of the Renaissance mans would be considered um, Leonardo da Vinci, excuse me. You know Leonardo as a, probably an artist, but also he was a skilled inventor. He was a skilled mathematician. Um, he was a writer. He wrote poetry. So he knew how to do many different things. So he'd be considered a, a Renaissance man. Um, one kind of important thing that you need to know that kind of is more important towards our next step called the Protestant Reformation, but still important, is the idea of a printing press. You know, before this, guys, if you had to make a book, me, you, and about 15 other clergy members or priests would sit down and we copy the book. And the book that we probably copied was the Bible. And we probably wrote in Latin because other people and priests would be copying the same thing. And then we do it by hand. We start on page one and we copy it. 
What Joel and Gutenberg is he steals an idea from the Chinese. Again, yes, the Chinese made this before he did as a German, but he brings it over into um, Germany and notice the word Gutenberg. That's a very German name. And he creates, again, one of the most important inventions, obviously, in human history, probably besides the human wheel and besides probably the internet, probably, I mean, the human wheel, excuse me, the wheel. Let's probably go the wheel, the printing press, and probably I'd say the internet now. The internet's really transforming a lot of different things and how we do things. I mean, the fact that I'm doing a podcast right now is, is an example of that. But what he does is he creates this thing in a movable type. So he, if you want to look at my hands instead of looking at the paper. So he takes all of these little typewriters, he puts them into a page, he sets that page in ink, and that would be page one. And so he'd go click, click, click. I'm, I'm sure you could Google printing press and you could have an idea of how this works. But anyway, so you'd make about 15 pages of page one. And then you make pages of page two. And by the end, you'd have 15 books. But instead of people handwriting it, you just bam, stamp it, stamp, it, stamp it on the on paper. And now you have a book. So he's the first one that creates one of our our books. Um, I guess you could thank him. I guess he's the reason why you have an AP Euro book that looks like the thickness of a dictionary and is called a Bible in our AP Euro class. So Thank Gutenberg. But why is he important? Why do I care about a huge typewriter? Well, remember, the Renaissance was about arts and literature. And notice what country we're in. We're in Germany. And what's funny? Look what's funny. What does he print? The first thing he prints is what? The Bible. I hope that you're understanding the theme here. In, in the northern areas, and let me type some northern countries. Again, that'd be Germany. It would be um, the Netherlands. Um, it would be um, perhaps Switzerland at this time. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Germany is not Germany right now. We're going to put HRE. And HRE stands for the Holy Roman Empire. Um, Netherlands, Switzerland. Um, pretty much those are the main three, like, big northern countries we're thinking of at this time. You know, so... Anyway, so this is happening in Germany. And remember, in the northern countries, as opposed to Italy, Italy was an art movement more than literature. That's kind of reversed up in the northern Renaissance. In the northern Renaissance, it's more of a literature movement than it's so much as an art movement, if that makes sense. And honestly, if you know your Ninja Turtles, you know probably the most famous artists. And those artists that were the most famous were all Italian. Raphael, Michelangelo, Leonardo, and Donatello. All four of these guys were major artists, but they were in Italy. They're not writers. And so you can see how Gutenberg is important because, first of all, he helped support the Renaissance and helped support humanism by being able to create more books so that more people can be can educated. Also, these books are being printed not in Latin, but that vernacular. Remember, the English, the Spanish, the Italian, so that more people can read it. Why is that important? Guys, more people are getting educated. More people are actually listening to this idea of humanism. And if people get educated, things become a little bit scary. And we're going to talk about that in our next podcast, which will be about the Protestant Reformation. So I hope you guys enjoyed this. This is a summation of humanism. Um, and you're probably looking at this going, but what about Italian Renaissance art? Don't worry. We probably already covered that or we're going to cover it again. So don't worry, but this is about humanism. So I hope you enjoyed it. Till the next one. All right, guys. Take care.